that's kind of what it comes down to presuppositions. You, if you know you have this inclination to go in that direction, then you know you have to constantly fight that, right? There's no yeah. way I would have bought a Bible. Something had to happen to get me that interested to even go so far as to buy the Bible to look at it. I don't think that's coincidence or my own, you know, um, uh, you know, uh, um, intellectual power. I think what that is, is these are the things that God has to do. And so, so I recognize that. All right. Well, I'm very, very excited to have my next guest on. He is the author of Cold Case Christianity, God's Crime Scene, and Forensic, Forensic Faith, which admittedly I only have one copy of, but I have bought at least five copies of Cold wow. Case Christianity because I, I keep giving them away to people because it's, it's, in my opinion, one of the best apologetic books out there. The website is coldcasechristianity.com. Right. You can follow him on Twitter at Jay Werner Wallace. Jim, thank you so much for being here, sir. Oh, so glad to be with you. We're under the size of the country, but it's amazing what we can do with technology. I'm just glad to be able to talk to you. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, people ask me a lot, you know, apologists who have influenced my thinking. And, you know, there's, there's a lot of names that come to mind. You, I have to say, have revolutionized my thinking, especially when it comes to um, the, the New Testament, because I'm, I'm anytime I'm witnessing now and talking about the New Testament, I'm always bringing up uh, analogies like you do with criminal cases and, you know, the chain of custody when we're talking about right. changing over time. Um, yeah. So maybe to start off, for people who don't know you, uh -huh. if you could tell us a little bit about your background uh, before coming to faith and doing apologetics. Yeah, I, I wasn't uh, exposed to anybody who really thought about Christianity this way. As a matter of fact, most of the people I knew who were Christians and I didn't have any growing up, really. You know, I didn't have anyone in my family who was a church attender. You know, I didn't really, I couldn't even tell you if there were people like cousins or aunts. I mean, I just did not have anyone even remotely close to my nuclear family and my extended family that were were Christians. So the only experience I had was like what, what TV might do. And I did have some people in my family who were like kind of cultural Catholics, maybe like like um, Christmas and Easter kind of, of Catholics. And so I kind of had a sense that that might be what Christianity was. But but my, my wife had a much better experience growing up um, and at least was exposed. She knew about church. And, and when we were probably together about 18 years, so we were adults, I was 35, um, she started to ask you, should we start attending church? Because we had young kids and we were wondering, and my dad's a guy who's a committed atheist, but he would bring his, if, if his wife had said to him, Hey, let's bring our kids to church. Now they, he divorced my mom when I was very young, but if, if she, if his second wife wanted to bring her, the kids to church, he would say, yeah, let's do this. Not because he believes it's true, but because he believed it was in some ways beneficial to kids. You know, it was, um, I would say it's kind of like it was a, a useful delusion. Um, it, it, you can at least instill some moral values that your kids would fear were, you know, the punishment would be more severe than what I might offer as a parent. So that had value to him. And, and I would have been the same way. Said, you know, if, if my wife wants to do this and, and she's adamant about doing it and I can please her by going, I'll go. And that's really how I ended up in, in church for the first time to even hear the pitch, to even hear someone talk about Jesus of Nazareth. And I happened to be in a church where the pastor spoke of him um, as though he had some value beyond just the value of salvation. Like, in other words, he might have some wise advice in addition to wisdom about the things of God. That, in fact, this pastor made the bold claim that Jesus, the teaching of Jesus of Nazareth, was really the foundation of Western civilization. And so I thought, well, I, I, as a kid, you know, I was interested in, in fortune cookie wisdom. And if that's all you can glean out of this, I was willing to buy a Bible just to do that. And that's why I purchased the first one. And I can remember, I still have it sitting here on my shelf. Um, it's It was a pew Bible, you know, just a $6, the kind of thing you would see in a pew. I wasn't going to spend a lot of money on this. And although there were better versions of that out there, I went to the local bookstore. That was back when they we had bookstores. Believe it or not, for those of you watching, there used to be these places, these stores, where you could go and buy a book. It was crazy. But anyway, I, I bought my first Bible there, and I think I spent about 6 bucks. And I just started to go to kind of go through it line by line. Uh, and, and what I was doing, originally was just kind of looking for the red letter stuff. Um, but as I was reading through it, it struck me that um, there's like a texture to eyewitness accounts. And you, you learn this 
if you read a bunch of them, if you, you know, if let's say you're, I was an investigator at the time and I was working in our undercover position, I was working, you know, major crimes, uh, but let's just say you're working a series of robberies and you've got 30 robberies and you think you have the right guy. You think you've got somebody in mind who might be the robber. He seems to fit the description. Well, you're not going to go knock on his door. If you're working in a surveillance team, you're actually going to go watch this guy for weeks and see if he does a robbery. <laughs> then you'll know for sure he's your robber, right? But in the meantime, while I'm, we're on the surveillance, I'm reading through all the cases. So I've got to you know, make sure not all of them are going to be our agency, might be local agencies. So I'm collecting all these reports, and I'm reading the eyewitness accounts, related to each of the 30 counts of robbery. So even on a one case like that, you might read hundreds of eyewitness accounts that were written by uh, an officer or detective who, who's not the eyewitness. He's writing the account of the eyewitness. And, and so, so you get a, a sense of, number one, uh, you ne two, witnesses are never going to agree. So, so you get a sense of the level of variation between eyewitness accounts that you would look at and say, that seems reasonable. And, and that's a very intuitive thing. That's not necessarily like, a, there's no science to this. It's not like I'm going to figure out what number of words can I allow to be in variation. It's just that after doing it a long time, you just kind of feel like, yeah. Or you can kind of get a thing where you go, no, that's that's not true. That that Here's the problem over here. So, so after having done that thousands of times, uh, when I came across the Gospels, the level of variation between the accounts it struck me as being right in that range that I would expect if these were actually eyewitness accounts, either eyewitness accounts written directly by the eyewitnesses or scribed to a scribe or conveyed to an author like Mark or Luke who might then write them down. You kind of get a sense for this, right? So I just started using what we call forensic statement analysis to kind of measure. And in forensic statement analysis, what you're doing is you're looking for deception indicators. Because you're going to have bad guys write down what they did on the day of the crime. And then you're going to look at that statement and analyze it looking at, and I've used it also with witnesses. I've used it with transcripts where in cold cases where um, uh, bad guys have, have given a, a statement and then I get it transcribed and I'm able to kind of go word for word through it. So that skill set was really helpful for me. And as I did this, I became more and more convinced that these were number one, these really were eyewitness accounts of a series of events in the life of a guy named Jesus of Nazareth. And then the, ultimately these were reliable accounts because the way we measure those things, they seem to pass that test and it bugged me. Um, and so that's, that was part of the slow process that led me toward uh, looking at Jesus more seriously than I probably ever thought I would. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. That's really interesting. Especially um, how you say it struck you as, these, this isn't narrative. This is more eyewitness testimony. Because that's yeah. even something I think about when I'm reading the Old Testament. You know, because I yes. hear people saying, well, these are kind of ancient stories and they're made up. And it doesn't read like that. Like they're telling this person went to this land and he married this person. And then they're talking about the genealogy. He gave birth to this person. And even in Exodus, when it's all the specifics about the temple, it, admittedly, it can get kind of boring. But that's because it's it's written as history. It's, it's yeah, not written I, as a yeah. narrative. No, you're absolutely right. As a matter of fact, you know, my wife and I, we go through, try to go through a chapter a night of, of scripture. And we happen to be in the book of Acts right now. I think we're in like chapter 15. And, and if you read through the book of Acts and you see what Luke includes, there are many places. Now, look, I've, I have met very clever liars who will include certain aspects because they think that, that they, by including this, it'll make the account seem more legitimate. So that does happen. Mm. But there are, are, are places in the book of Acts where you're thinking, why in the world would you include this detail? This detail, and, and I've, I've done my best to read through all the potential commentaries. Maybe I'm missing something. Maybe this, this little detail is important for some theological principle. So he includes it in the elaborate lie because he's trying to make some obscure theological. Those are, those are things you've got to consider, right? But mm -hmm. as I'm looking through this, what I see again and again and again is just this really kind of... If he meets a certain person who does things a certain way, it gets recorded that way. And even though it, has, it really doesn't help the story, it seems to be a bit of a distraction. I don't know why you would include that in this, unless, of course, it just happened to happen that way. And then for whatever reason, you decide to, because maybe you heard about it from somebody. I get it. There are things about that that I thought were, and I wish I could tell you that all of that is highly scientific and it's data and statistically research. But a lot of it is just, if you if you had to, read eyewitness accounts 
for 15 years, you will eventually have a sense of what is bull and what is true, mm. right? And that that sense, and you see it when you watch cop shows, right? You'll have some character in the cop show who right away calls the bluff. And you're going, hmm, that, does it ever really happen that way? Well, sometimes it does happen that way because you're so used to being lied to that, number one, you know how to kind of circumvent, how to ask certain questions to expose the lie quicker. And you also kind of know, when, and, and it's not a perfect science, I have been lied to. Uh, but it usually it happened earlier in my in my career, and uh, you kind of work those things out. Of course, if you just assume everyone's a liar, you've got a pretty good chance of protecting yourself. And that's really how I came on the the gospels. You know, I, it wasn't like I have a good friend, uh, Lee Strobel. You probably know him from the Case for Christ, right? The Case for mm-hmm. the Case for Everything. Lee has, has done a brilliant amount of work in this field. And when he first was uh, interested in looking at Christianity, he was really taking it on from the mindset of his wife, Leslie, who believed it was true. And he was after it to kind of believe, to kind of show her that this is not true. And in the course of doing that, he kind of discovered some things that he thought was were, thought were, were compelling. That was not me. I was not trying to disprove it. I, I, I was a cocky and arrogant in my atheism in the sense that it was very easy to either stump or frustrate frustrate my the the few Christians I knew who were in law enforcement, and by the way, in law enforcement you have a bunch of alpha dogs who don't like being stumped, and so when you can twist these guys in knots, you're thinking to yourself, really? So this is the best you guys got, and they don't seem to be all that good, and they certainly didn't have the kind of the answers that I was looking for, and I could offer the simp the same simple uh, atheist objections we still see online today. I was offering those back in 1994, and um, and these guys really didn't have a way to respond. They didn't have any good answers. So I really felt like, hey, this is not worth my time. I did not take it on like, I'm going to prove this wrong. I didn't think it was worthy of my time. I didn't think it, that that's, that's ridiculous. No one takes on the story of uh, Peter Cottontail or Santa Claus and tries to prove it wrong. <laughs> no one does that. It wasn't worth my time. But as I read through it, it was just those those attributes – and that's why I focus on those in cold case Christianity, because I'm really trying to say, show there's a skill set you could use because we, 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 we don't trust eyewitnesses. People think we, we trust. Eye, no, we don't trust eyewitnesses. We, we test eyewitnesses. And there's a process of testing and vetting eyewitnesses. And that's what we, did, we tried to do in cold case Christianity. Mm-hmm. That's great. Um, yeah, it's funny. There's three different questions I've written down. You kind of touched on all of them in there. Okay. Um. So maybe the first one we can get to is because you talked about if someone is lying on an account, they might try to sneak a detail in there. Yes. yes. And I know I know part of the case for the Gospels being written early is one of the things is they don't mention the destruction of the temple, which we right. know happened in 70 AD. Um. But I have heard atheists say, well, and actually the New Testament does have the destruction of the temple in the form of Jesus predicting it. And right. so that that they say that that was a sneaky way for them to put in the destruction of the temple, but but to try to make it more look like Jesus could predict it. How would you respond to that? Well, no, I, I agree with you. But but if you think about um, and I see that I see. Uh, it's, but for example, Luke, who writes two volumes, Luke and Acts, right? He's going to present these as one huge volume, two books in one huge volume. And, and he even says this to Theophilus in the beginning of the book of Acts and in the beginning of the Gospel of Luke. So he introduces um, all of it uh, in in the Gospel of Luke. He introduces Theophilus as most excellent, and then when he refers to him again in the first chapter of Acts, he he's less is less formal, and he says, "In my former book, I wrote to you." Now it's interesting to me that in the one book, in the in the prelude, he basically everyone knows that Jesus predicts the destruction of the temple, and that's the reason why I expect to see it in Acts. If you're going to sneak it in as a prediction and you're writing to somebody, I mean, they know what occurs, but why wouldn't you at least draw their attention to the fact that these predictions took place? These these predictions actually occurred over here. But there's not just the one thing that's missing. It's not just the destruction of the temple. It's that there's lots of reasons for dispersions, lots of reasons for hardship of, of Christians in the first century. It is the siege of Jerusalem. It is the destruction of Jerusalem and the, and the temple. None of this data is, is, a, is mentioned by Luke. Okay, maybe he, that's not his emphasis. Okay, fine. But how about this? He mentions key players. And several of these key players die in the 60s. Mm-hmm. 
Uh, Peter dies in the 60s, Paul dies in the 60s, and James, the brother of John, dies in the 60s. As a matter of fact, Barnabas dies in 61. So there you've got four key players that get a lot of ink in the gospel in the book of Acts, none of whom are mentioned in terms of their death, even though someone like as inconsequential, an early death, and it's the only one we know for sure this this early, is the death of James, the brother of John, right? There's an apostle who dies in 44. Well, that gets in there. Well, why would you put that? Well, because he's an apostle. Well, really, has he really said anything about the activity of James, the brother of John, that would warrant his mentioning his death? But he does mention it. Yet James, the brother of Jesus, whose activity is chronicled you know, foot by foot, nothing about his death. Nothing about Peter's death. As a matter of fact, the way these men die is 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 compelling, and I think would actually bolster the case that these folks died without flinching, and without changing their story. Those are good data points to put in the gospel. That the, 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 if, if you didn't have any of it, just Paul. You're tracking along with Paul. Paul's your key story. Paul. 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 He's in Rome. He's in custody in Rome. He's about to die in Rome. We know he dies around 63, 64. Yet you don't mention that. That could be the, the, the climactic final chapter in which Paul, your lead character, dies for the sake of the gospel. It's not there. Um, and and that, that to me was interesting. But it's not just that. It's not just the historical data related to Jerusalem that's missing. It's not just the deaths of those key players that's missing. It's it's also that this seems to be supported by internal evidence in the Gospels, at least in the letters of Paul, in both his letter to, Tim to Timothy and, but more importantly, his letter to the Corinthian church, in which he seems to know the data that Luke is using in his Gospel related to the Lord's Supper. And I've heard people say, well, come on, that's just that they're quoting some original source. The, the, my point is, that what is more likely? Is it more likely, people sometimes will say, well, couldn't Luke be quoting Paul? Here's what I know. I know that the words that Luke uses in his gospel are being quoted to the Corinthian church as early as 53 AD. And Paul is, in essence, telling them, I taught you how to do the Lord's Supper. And now you people are getting drunk before the Lord's Supper. It's very inappropriate. Now, I'm going to remind you of what was passed on. And he recites this passage from Luke's gospel. And it's a pretty decent number of words that are copied out of Luke's gospel. And, and I'll tell you that even if this is not, he's citing something that was not written, perhaps he's just citing something that is part of the verbal transmission of the story of Jesus. I'm okay with that. Here's why I say that. Um, there's often times when I will meet, I'm working a cold case. Cold cases are just unsolved murders. And I might go back to about 1979 to about 1988-ish. So I'm always working these cases from the past. Let's say I have a case in 1980. A guy is uh, a witness to the case, but nobody interviews him. Nobody. And then I discover by reopening the case, this guy exists, and I find him. He's now in Idaho. And I call him up and I say, hey, can you give me your statement? And he says, yeah, this is what happened. I'm like, wow, that's really empower that's powerful. We didn't have that back in 1980 when this when this occurred. Nobody found you. Nobody, you, you didn't come forward. Well, I had to leave the area, and I just didn't think you, anybody was that important, so I just never contacted anybody. Okay, so now I have this critical piece of data an account from 1980, but I didn't learn about it till 2019. It, I'm, I'm, now I'm going to write the first report ever written about this eyewitness account. It's 2019. We're way behind the curve. We're 39 years behind the curve. So how do I know? Well, so I said to him, okay, do me a favor. Was there anybody else back in the day that you told this to? Yes. Okay, don't, don't, uh, before you can, you can contact them, Stay on the line with me. I want to call these people. And I get a hold of those people and I say, do you remember this guy back in 1980 saying anything about this? And he says, yeah, they say, yeah. And they basically repeat the story that he gave me. Well, now the fact that it was not recorded for 39 years, does it really matter to me? What matters is, was the eyewitness testimony available? Was there somebody there who was available to see this back in 1980? And I've now confirmed that. It does not matter that 39 years have gone by before it was written down. So when I look at those kinds of things, what I'm really trying to, to, to isolate is how early was this account of Jesus 
available. What form is it available? Don't don't care. Because the, it's harder to tell the lie early than it is late. This is why when Paul in 1 Corinthians says that there are more than 500 of the brethren who saw Jesus at one time, most of whom remain until now, but some have, have fallen asleep. He's telling the people in that generation, 53, 54 AD, that there were still nearly 500 people alive they could interview. That's why that's so important. It's tougher, I think, to tell that that lie in uh, in front of people who would know better, who would know if mm -hmm. it was a lie. It's much easier to wait till everyone's dead and then just say whatever you want to say. You know, write this in the second century. Who in the world would know if you're telling the truth? But if you're writing it and talking about it and presenting it as evidence as early as Paul is in 1 Corinthians, I'll tell you, 1 Corinthians 15 is a powerful piece of textual evidence. And even skeptics like a Bart Ehrman does not deny the Pauline authorship of 1 Corinthians and does not deny the early authorship of 1 Corinthians. He would put it in the early 50s. Mm -hmm. That's too early. That's 20 years after the resurrection. And how long have they been talking about this? He presents things to Timothy in the 60s. They, they, he describes them as scripture. I, I just think there's, there's it's, it's, so yeah, I always say, is it possible? Anything's possible, but I don't think it's reasonable that this is a late document. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I do think that we can date it using the missing elements that are in, because this got separated as a text, right? And so I think, honestly, if you're going to say that, the predict that Jesus says that, and by the way, that's a lot of reasons. I was talking to Dan Wallace about this many years ago. You know, why do skeptics sometimes want to date the Gospels later? There's two ways to do that. One way would be to say, well, I've got textual evidence. I've got some piece of, of, of textual evidence, right? Uh, manuscript evidence that would tell me when to date it. That is not what's, what, what's causing them to date it late. What's causing them to date it late is that they see that Jesus predicted the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. And because they have an anti-supernatural bias that says no one can predict that, it must have already happened. Therefore, they could put that in as though it's a prediction. And so they want to date it post-70 AD. So they're not looking at this interior evidence that we're looking at. They're not looking at all those things, missing elements. They're not looking at how early the Gospels are cited by Paul. They're not looking about how early the first um, students of the eyewitnesses began to repeat the story. Because if they were, they wouldn't date it this late. But instead, they're using that. What's dating it is that, number one, they don't think anything supernatural ever happens. So these must have been written after the destruction of the temple. And they must have been written after anyone who was an eyewitness was dead because they contain all these miracle accounts. We know those can't happen because miracles don't happen. Therefore, they've got to be written late so that nobody would catch that. Nobody would know. Well, that to me is not based on, on textual evidence or manuscript evidence. That's really based on your presupposition against anything miraculous. Mm -hmm. that, yeah, that's like, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that because I, I noticed that in my conversations, uh, you know, they'll take one piece of evidence out and think that they can refute that and that bust the whole case. But it's really a cumulative case. Oh. Maybe one piece doesn't stand alone, but yeah, there's I, so I, many I can... pieces to it. I can tell you that what you just said is really powerful because a, a lot of my approach to this is is um, kind of born in my experience in criminal trials. So every criminal trial we do on a cold case, uh, remember, cold cases were unsolved back then. Well, the reason why they were unsolved back then, they were lame, okay? Mm -hmm. We didn't have good evidence. We didn't have a lot of stuff that we typically want to make a case. So the DA looked at it and said, they've got nothing here, bud. We're not filing this. So they didn't file it. So now we come at it years later. It's not like we have fingerprint evidence or DNA. Uh, there are some times when DNA, especially now, by the way, uh, ancestry DNA is doing uh, wonders for the law enforcement community, right? But we just didn't have that. Um, and a lot of times the, the, these weren't protected because there was no DNA mindset back in 1979. So some of these things weren't even sampled. And then when they were, they were contaminated. So it's, it's a mess. Now, what's what's interesting about that is that we know that when we build these cases in front of the jury, they are cumulative cases. I call these death by a thousand paper cuts for a reason. Each little piece feels like it's kind of, really? If that's all you had, nobody would ever convict this guy. But it's because you have 80 of these you know, paper cuts that surround the suspect that, that you really have a good inference. 
and it's, it's, and you could say, well, is it possible that there's just 80 stellar coincidences in which these 80 planets were perfectly aligned? Well, yeah, that's that's possible. But the more reasonable explanation is he's just guilty and responsible. He is the one common causal factor that unifies all of these finger these these paper cuts. Okay, mm-hmm. um, and so so what defense attorneys always do. And we we tell in our close, as a matter of fact, we have a presentation that's part of our, our rebuttal. Mm-hmm. In every single trial, we use it over and over and over again because every single defense attorney in his closing argument does that. He takes out each piece and tries to get rid of it. In other words, he tries to give it, explain it away a different, a, some other way. And we we tell people, don't get, don't, you're not, we, there's danger in not seeing the, the, the forest, you know, for the trees because you, you, you basically are, he wants you to focus on that little tree. Mm-hmm. And miss the forest. And so again, the only way to, to 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 infer on that is to say, well, yeah, it's just an amazing coincidence that 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 the the temple's not mentioned, that the destruction of Jerusalem's not mentioned, that the death of of Peter's not mentioned, and Paul's not mentioned, and James is not mentioned, and Barnabas is not mentioned. And by coincidence, they happen to mention Stephen and James, the brother of John, who are very minor players compared to the other four. And it's just a coincidence that he happens to mention this to Timothy. He happens to quote Luke's gospel and call it scripture. It's just a coincidence that he mentions to the Corinthians. Yeah, it could be. It could be that this is all just individual stuff that doesn't really have any connectivity at all. But that's not reasonable. And I try to illustrate yeah. it. If, you're, if your kid uh, is a teenager and he comes home one night and, and goes right to bed and you don't get to talk to him and the next morning... You get up and you see that his car is parked kind of away from the curb. It's like like kind of crooked and like three feet away from the curb on one side. And you walk over to the car and you, you look on the floor on the ground next to the driver's door and you see a little receipt. And it's all crumpled up and you open it up. It's to a liquor store for a fifth of vodka. And you go, really? What's that about, right? And then he stumbles out of bed three hours late and he's still got the clothes he was in last night. And he smells like alcohol, right? And he's got a headache and, he's just, and he, yeah. It's possible that all of these things are unrelated, but what you're going to do in your mind as a parent is you're going to put together all the paper cuts and you're going to go, dude, what were you doing last night? I would hope you would. That's your common sense assembling the circumstantial cumulative case. And we do this all the time. That's all we're doing here is we're assembling a cumulative case. And and my, my expectation is always the defense attorneys go after the pieces and try to make sure you don't see the forest. They want to just take a look at each tree, get hung up, get so close to that tree that you can't back up and see the forest. And that's what they always do. And because that's so consistent, we get a chance, you know, it's it. They, we do our closing argument, then the defense does their closing argument. And because we have the burden of proof, we do a rebuttal. They don't get a chance to answer our rebuttal, okay? Because we have the burden. So we get two chances, one to close, he closes, and then we rebut his closing. And because we know this is what he's going to do in the closing, our rebuttal already has that part assembled. <laughs> Don't get caught up in his attempt to make you see the tree only and miss the whole forest. Back up and see the entire body of evidence. So the same thing is true for us when we're talking to people who would like to kind of drill down on one paper cut piece of evidence and try to get rid of it. Well, fine. Good luck with that. It's not it's not a case built on one piece. It's the case built cumulatively. Mm. Yeah, that's good. Um, that helps. No, definitely it does. Um, one thing I wanted to ask you, and I, I've been thinking through this a bit lately, is the claim you know skeptics make extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. Mm-hmm. And I wanted to share with you my thoughts and then, and then get okay. your take on it. Yeah. So my take is there's two things they could mean by that. One is it's extraordinary because it's supernatural, in which case the claim is really supernatural claims require supernatural evidence. And to me, that's not going anywhere because it's like, well, what supernatural evidence do you expect? Should God appear in the sky every 10 years to remind us that the resurrection really happened? So to be generous, the more reasonable claim for them to be making would be because so much rides on this claim. It's extraordinary because of the eternal implications of it. And in that case, I think the way you draw analogies to these court cases are, is really important because you might think, well, is a, a murder an extraordinary, extraordinary claim? And they might say no. And you might say, but wait a minute. Think of the implications. You're putting a, a man in jail who's accused of murdering somebody for a really long time, potentially his life. That's going to affect his kids if he has any, his wife yeah. if he has any, the rest of his family. So the implications, it's an extraordinary claim. So you better have some pretty darn good evidence that it's 
the case. And I think you can do the same thing with Jesus. And in these court cases, each piece of evidence might not seem so extraordinary on its own, but built as a cum cumulative case, it doesn't necessarily leave you with a reasonable alternative. Yeah, I think you're right in trying to get the definition of what they mean by extraordinary. So if what you mean by extraordinary is that the, 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 the but you could be like you're saying, just that they think this has got extraordinary gravity. It's, it's it's a grave issue. It's a it's an important issue. But but I sometimes wonder if they're talking about the the nature of the kind of evidence. So you're right if you're saying, well, okay, so because this is an extraordinary claim, I would need what what, what qualifies as extraordinary? You mean the the, the evidence has to be otherworldly? Okay, could we even define that? How would we even know? That means you were just excluding any possibility of proving it because we don't have access to otherworldly things. We're trying to prove the existence of an otherworldly thing. So I think that doesn't really go anywhere. But I think what they really mean is, is that 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 that, that the weight of the evidence, that the amount of evidence, that the, the the case should be extraordinarily locked tight, that it should be, you know, in some way. But I would always say this: we build evidence, even for, and I think murders are extraordinary. Especially if you look at the number of murders that will occur annually in a state like California, where, or even in Chicago, let's say, where you think, my gosh, there's all kinds of murders happening in Illinois. Well, the state of Illinois, if you were to look at it, you'd see that really the, for people who are living and dying of normal causes in Illinois, very few are murdered, okay? And, and sometimes these are extraordinary um, events in the terms of how the murder occurs. I had a murder in California, and we don't, even though we have a lot of murders, we have a lot more people than we have murders. So the percentage of murders per person in California is extraordinarily low, not compared to other states perhaps, but just in general terms. The percentage is incredibly low given how many people there are. And then the kinds of murder, I had a murder with a garrote, which is a strangulation device. I did a search uh, nationally to figure out, can I ask anybody, has anybody had a garrote murder of this nature. My gosh, this was like in the one percentile of the one percentile of murders. I mean, it was like ridiculously low. Now, okay, so this is an extraordinary claim. You think that this guy built a garrote when nobody does that, using materials, by the way, which were unbelievably unwise to build a garrote, very, very rare. Why would you even use those materials? And committed a murder of this nature, which is extraordinarily rare. Okay, this is an unusual case. But I'm, it turns out that I build that case in front of a jury the same way I build any case. The same forms of evidence, the same kinds of interviews, the same kinds of observations about behavior. This, everything's exactly the same as you would build it if you were doing a residential burglary. It's the same forms and types of evidence built in the same way, even though this crime compared to residential burglary is incredibly rare. And it's extraordinary. So it turns out that we use very ordinary um, uh, evidence to prove extraordinary claims about extraordinary events. And that, that happens all the time. And I, and I think that for the most part, if you look, look, look at it this way, if, if you want me to believe that the universe we live in came into existence from nothing, that all space, time, and matter came into existence from nothing without a cause, it just came into existence from nothing. And there's lots of atheists who would say that's the case. And that in addition to that, the fine tuning we see is just a, a coincidence. And they might argue there's a, a, a number of multiverses and we are just one of those multiverses. Okay, where's the evidence for that? In other words, it's not as though the Christian is the only one making extraordinary claims. And then we say, well, what kind of evidence would you use to demonstrate the existence of a multiverse? To demonstrate that this kind of universe could come into existence from nothing, that it could actually initiate life from non-life and actually account for the information we see in DNA, would actually account for the appearance of design that even Richard Dawkins says is in biology, that could, could somehow materially present a series of events that could result in the immaterial mind, which is free to make free agent choices. Look, what I'm saying is, those are extraordinary claims of what space, time, and matter can do without any agency. Okay, do I, and, and they're gonna say, well, yes, we can make those claims though, using all the scientific processes we use to prove that this, you know, that this set of glasses is falling into my hands. Really? Okay, if, if you don't have to use extraordinary evidence to prove your extraordinary claims, then allow me not to have the same burden 
because I think in the end, I would agree, we can make a case for your position as a naturalist and for my position as a supernaturalist with the same kinds of evidence taking the same approach. Hmm. It, it's it's almost as if you were peeking at my notes, sir. Let, not even kidding. My next page is going to be the segue <laughs> into God's crime scene, and I even have the multiverses written down here. Um, so so that's a perfect segue. So it's funny. I was going to bring up a phone call I had with a friend of mine. Okay. The other day. He he lives in Kentucky, and uh, he's he's a Christian, but he's kind of agnostic in a way. You know, okay. he, he kind of he struggled got, with got it. Got questions basically about certain yeah, things. Yeah, right? a lot of questions. Yeah. Okay. And uh, one thing he was saying to me was, well, we can explain most things through science, and maybe there's this little sliver where God can come in. And immediately I went to the bookshelf, I pulled out God's crime scene, I was like, well, here's, here's, here's eight things that science can't necessarily explain. And I think it's, it's, it's such a great approach because, you know, you hear a lot of atheists say, well, there's no evidence for God, or how could there even in principle be evidence for God? And you're really just simply asking the question, well, can we explain everything in the universe by staying in the right. universe? Or is there any evidence yeah. that we need to go outside of it? Well, look at it this way. If we were at a crime scene together and I had a, a dead woman at a crime scene and we're standing on the one side of the yellow tape and, and you said to me, um, I think her husband's the one who did this based on what I see inside that crime scene. I can see several things around her body. I can see several pieces of evidence related to the body. I can see the context of the kind of room we're in. Uh, based on what I see inside the yellow tape, I think the best and most reasonable explanation for this murder is her husband. And then my other partner says, well, no, man, are you crazy? She's got a roommate uh, who lives with the couple. Uh, in, come on. That's the one who I think is responsible. Okay, great. Each of you then has to demonstrate why it is that you think your cause can best explain what's on the other side of the yellow tape. If you think the husband did it, show me why. If you think that the roommate did it, their roommate, show me why. What we have here is we're looking across the yellow tape at the universe, and there are things in the crime scene that we all agree exist. We have to explain how the crime scene got here, how did the universe get here, why does it appear to be designed, fine-tuned at least, and that's not even a controversial uh, topic. I mean, most people on both sides, even secular, atheist, astrophysicists, will agree to the appearance of fine-tuning. I think actually the fine-tuning in the universe is one of the things that drives, it's the tail that wags the dog on the multiverse theorist, if you ask me. And then you've got to explain the origin of life in the universe, the appearance of design and biology, consciousness, free agency, objective moral Moral truths, even whatever standard you think you're using to determine that something is evil. These are things we all have to explain. Now, I would say on this side of the yellow tape that I think a personal, all-powerful being is the best and most reasonable inference, the best causal agent to explain what's on the other side of the yellow tape. Now, my partner might say, you know what? No, I think natural forces alone Space, time, matter, physics, and chemistry, that's all I can work with, can explain everything on the other side of the tape. Okay, in the same way that both my partners had a burden of proof, both of us in this scenario have a burden of proof. It's typically said that you are the only one as a theist who has a burden of proof. Well, hang on, that's not how it works. How it works is we look at the crime scene and we posit a causal agent or force or factor and then each of us makes a case for why we think our cause is the best explanation. That naturalist is positing a cause. He's saying that whatever's in there, you can get that with just space, time, matter, physics, and chemistry. That's his claim. He has an equal burden of proof. Now, it turns out that that it's, you'll sometimes hear people say, well, yeah, well, you may have found the eight things we cannot yet explain. Okay. But when we go to a jury trial, we, we pull the trigger on, no, I shouldn't say it that way. We, we render a verdict um, based on where we are evidentially today. Uh, we don't allow jurors to say, well, you know, he looks guilty. But man, new, develop, new, witness, new uh, evidence could develop in the next 20 years that will show that we're, okay, we're asking you right now. If you're saying right now, given this evidence, that he is clear, in your mind, that best inference is he's guilty, then render the verdict. If you think he's, he's not guilty, then render the not guilty. But the point is, we, we don't allow you to say, well, right now it looks like X, but 20 years from now, things could change. Look, if things change 20 years from now, we'll retry this guy, okay? We're talking about what does it look like today? And so I think it's fair for us to say that, yeah, right now, science doesn't answer those questions and can't answer those questions. It's been trying to answer them for a long time and it's, it's really failed. And by the way, if, and, and it's not as well they don't have answers. Well, they'll offer you answers. But none of these scientific experts agree on the answer. 
and each one thinks the other answer offered by the other scientists is ludicrous. So if you think that there's like consensus on multiverse theory to explain fine tuning, oh no, there's not. As a matter of fact, there's a bunch of astrophysicists who think that's a cheat. They would reject that altogether on the basis of the same scientific evidence. So here's what I'm, I'm offering. I'm saying here right now, I think the best inference for those eight characteristics of the universe is an all-powerful, non-spatial, non-temporal, non-material um, cause that is the fine-tuner with a purpose in mind who is fine-tuning a universe to sustain itself and support carbon-based life, who is the source of information as a mind, the source of information we see in the genetic code so that life can originate in that universe, and is the designer behind the design we see in biology, and because he is designing in his image as a mind who is a free agent, he designs creatures that have minds and act freely, and because he is, by his very nature, the source of moral truth, and he, we sense this moral obligations on transcendent objective moral claims, well, we don't have obligations between forces. Obligations are only between persons. So now we need a moral person to whom we are feeling obligated. And he's even the standard of righteousness by which we would say, you know what? When it violates that standard, he is the sunshine that causes the shadow, right? He is the source of moral truth that when it's violated, we sense that violation. We call that evil. Well, that's a reasonable inference that there's a being like that out there that accounts for all these things we see. And it's a much more satisfying answer than these. The, and I've kind of listed in the book all the alternative ways that people try to explain those eight things. I even did a diagram and you can see the dozens of explanations that are offered. And these guys don't agree with each other. Not only that, whatever someone's offering for the beginning of the universe will not get you objective moral truths. It will not get you um, mind. So you need another way to explain that. Well, it turns out there is one explanation we offer as theists that unifies all the evidence and accounts for all the evidence, and that is the idea that there is a, a, a supernatural being that fits that suspect profile. And that's why in the book I don't even try to talk about any of this from a biblical perspective. You don't need to do that. That's not what I did. I, when I first read the miracle accounts in the Gospels, I thought that's ludicrous. Whatever's true about Jesus, fine. But this miracle stuff is clearly not true because miracles don't occur. But as I kind of stepped back and said, well, now I need to kind of ask myself, what do I, if, if God exists and he's that kind of being, the being that could create all eight things of those, those eight things in the universe, that's a powerful, personal, divine being that could actually accomplish all of the miracles that are in the New Testament. So I need to know first, does that God exist? Because if he does, why am I questioning this small potato miracle stuff in the New Testament? If that God exists, the most amazing miracle of all time is Genesis 1, right? Everything from nothing. And I'm thinking walking on water is pretty small potatoes compared to that. I mean, mm -hmm. the, the resurrection is small potatoes. So it opens the door to some of the stuff that we see in the New Testament. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny. Uh, Greg Coco and I were just talking about how there's almost an irony. Because, you know, one of the things you talk about in court case Christianity, you answer the question, were the gospel writers biased? And you know, the same people who will say, well, we can't trust what they say because they're biased are the same people who have an anti-supernatural bias when they right. read the New Testament. And yeah. then so they don't want to accept it. And, you know, one of the things we said was the question isn't do they have a bias? The question is, do they have a bias that would cause them to distort the evidence That's for right. some yeah. personal reasons? That's right. Yes. And bias always comes down to motive. So they always, in any, in any, listen, the reason why people have a, I had this for years, the reason why people have an anti, there's only three motives behind any bad behavior, including murders. And I learned this working murders, but it applies to any lesser crime. It's financial greed, sexual lust, pursuit of power. And I will tell you that there are reasons in those three categories that you might want to reject the existence of an all powerful moral being that makes judgments about behavior. Now, I, I don't want to say that the reason why – some people just have – you know, they, they just – I don't think I had – the kind of life I was living before I became a Christian was pretty much like the life I'm living now. I mean I was in a long-term relationship, faithful relationship with my wife. I was working as a police detective, and I, I think I was – I still had all the same high standards. I knew right from wrong, and I wanted to – and I and I also signed on to a job where I knew I wasn't going to get rich. So I tried to, to protect myself from the three things that typically lead people to do stupid, right? Which are always sex, money, and power. So so 
the, the, the question is, what would be motivating someone to cause this bias to begin with? And I think for a lot of us, not, not necessarily all of us, but a lot of us who reject the existence of God, th those are factors we have to be honest about. You know, if it, it, it's, it was easy for me to, to, I always say it this way, to throw the dart on the wall and just draw the bullseye around wherever the dart lands, because I was always my own standard, my own standard of, of whether or not I was behaving well financially, sexually, and um, from a power perspective. A lot of times, just the simple idea, that I, I was very comfortable from a power perspective being my own God. And that was really driving me to 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 reject the existence of anything that might have authority over me. If nothing else, I did not want there to be a being. It was a power issue for me, and and that was what was I think driving a lot of my bias against Christianity in specific, at least, was that if that Christianity was true, uh, I would have to admit who I really because it makes claims not just about Jesus of Nazareth. Christianity makes claims about you and me and our need for a savior. And I wasn't ready to hear those yet. Uh, I can tell you that for sure. Uh, and so that's part of, I think, what drives it. We have to be careful that, that we don't, like you said, it's, it's, there's an irony in the fact that the people who would claim there's a bias be, behind the authors, everyone's got a bias. When we select jurors, we're looking and we're asking the questions. We know what your bias is. We'll ask, we'll try to get that out in the open. You know, if, if you've had problems with the police department before, if you've had problems in the area that we're going to be trying in this case, if you've had an interest in that area for some reason, if your husband's employed like the defendant was employed, we try to get to all the potential biases. But then we'll ask the question, okay, great. Do you think you can set down whatever it is you think about guys like our defendant, whoever that happens to be, or about the kinds of crimes that we're talking about in this case, and just be fair in your assessment of the evidence in this case. Because we know everyone's got a slant. Everyone's got presuppositions. We're simply asking people to suspend those, to, 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 know, to know that's how I'm wired and I have a tendency to think that way. So can I, for the sake of this case, reorient my thinking to be fair? That's kind of what we're looking for in jurors. And not everyone can do it. And that's a lot of times why um, <clears throat> jurors get hung on cases, because not everyone can can do that, can can suspend their their presuppositions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's funny you say that. One thing I talk about sometimes is that, you know, if you don't recognize that you have a bias, the bias can actually corrupt you because you don't realize it. The best thing you can do is realize you have a bias, admit what it is, and then right. see if you can best put it aside and try to evaluate something objectively. Um, no, this is I got friends in this industry, right, who who are all Christian apologists, and they were Christians a lot longer than me. And, and they were Christians earlier than I was. You know, they got to be Christians in their teens or in their twenties. And I was I had a lot of years to be the kind of skeptical jerk that I became, uh, especially when dealing with people who are always lying to you. And whenever they'll ask my advice, they know they're going to get the worst possible case scenario from me because that's what I do for a living, right? You assume the worst in people. Until you investigate that, and now, okay, now I finally trust you. But I don't start off trusting. I start off doubting. I start off saying, no, that guy's a liar. That's probably not true. Have you ever watched House, the, the old TV show where the doctor, House, he assumes that everyone who comes in to be diagnosed is lying for one reason or another, and that's kind of the assumption of the show. Well, that's, that's really where I stand, too. And so they know that that's my bias. They know that I'm a skeptic, and I'm assuming the worst in people, and they'll tease me about it. And I also know I have that inclination. So I have to, I have to work. Like all of us know where our, our, our rough edges are. And, and we have to work, right, to kind of smooth over our rough edges. That's kind of what it comes down to presuppositions. You, if you know you have this inclination to go in that direction, then you know you have to constantly fight that, right? Because, you know, you have to, you're always seeing the worst in people. You're going to have to fight that to not be a jerk all the time. So, so a lot of that is just trying to, to identify where the, the presuppositional bias is and then work hard to try to suspend it. Yeah. Yeah. And you, you just talked about, you know, kind of your maybe moral rejections or, or emotional rejections of Christianity before. Mm -hmm. So I guess kind of a personal question because mm -hmm. you talked about how you would easily poke holes. You had Christian friends who couldn't really defend their faith that well. What do you think if that young version of you had met the version of you now who could have answered those questions the way that you do? Mm. Well, okay, so here I am. I'm an evidential apologist. But I do recognize that something—God has to do something. 
in the heart of people before any of this. I'm not the kind of person who says the evidence will convince convince you. You don't even need the power of God. The evidence is so good, you'll be convinced. No, I think what happens is, is that, that God removed the enmity that I had toward him first. And then the means by which the truth of the gospel was communicated to me because of who I am, it needed to be evidential. You could have preached the gospel to me, and uh, I would have still had barriers of belief. But because who I am, I took this path, but I would never have been willing to take that path. There's no yeah. way I would have bought a Bible. Something had to happen to get me that interested to even go so far as to buy the Bible to look at it. I don't think that's coincidence or my own, you know, um, uh, you know, uh, um, intellectual power. I think what that is, is these are the things that God has to do. And so, so I recognize that. And if you had come to me, and I say this all the time, in the end, it would have been nice at least if people had removed my lame excuses. Because what I was really holding were a series of lame excuses. And because nobody could ever, you know, knock those down for me, I built those up into idols. You know, I could, I could use those. It's kind of like if you're a boxer and you learn certain punches that work for you. And you got a really good jab, and so you just jab the the, the dog snot out of your opponent until finally, because that's what you can do. And, and so that's kind of what I started to do intellectually. I had these things I could say to stop the conversation. If I just say this, dude's not, he's not always going to stop talking to me. I'm going to shake him. And, and so I was willing to do that because I felt like really of all the people who should be more reasonable, it should be you, Mr. Detective, my partner. Can I trust you on this case if I can't trust you on that stuff? Really, you hold to this stuff and you don't even know why it's true. And you just think, well, I've had an experience. Oh, good for you. Everyone's had an experience, okay? So so that's that's what you're going to offer me is your experience, how you became a Christian. Well, let me offer you how I didn't, okay? And if all we're doing is having a battle of experiences, <laughs> I win. Okay, that's what I would have said. So so I, I needed something a little more because of the kind of jerk I was. And so, and so I think that – and I think that that kind of thing has – you. Somebody was praying me into that position where I would probably, you know, where I would let down my guard and stop being a jerk long enough to see, is this actually good evidence? Now, I don't think what God does is he, he makes a, an unreasonable truth seem reasonable to us under his power. I think this is reasonable from the get-go. But we have uh, unreasonable biases that keep us from being fair. And, and that once we, that, that has been leveled, once God has removed the tilt, and so we are fair, oh man, this is obvious, right? How did I not see it before? How did I not look at this earlier? That's kind of the feeling you have, right? It's like an eye-opening experience. But, but I think that's, just, that, so that's, that's where I fall on, on that issue. I think if you would have uh, presented this with me earlier, I probably would have still been the jerk, but I would have known that my, my defenses were stripped. And I, by the way, you probably still having conversations. I'm having conversations still with people in my field who are either district attorneys or they're investigators working uh, major crimes or working homicides who were having these kinds of conversations. And they're still bantering back with me. They're still doing what I would have done. <laughs> Right. Mm -hmm. But but in the end, they realize that their arguments really aren't working anymore. Their their kind of clever catchphrase kind of meme quality objections aren't really working. And, but still, they haven't at this point, they still are, are satisfied that they're in this banter. But then occasionally I'll see somebody who I can I can tell um, something's happening in that guy's life. And all these objections are seeming more and more fragile to him. And now I'm able to work a little bit. Uh, and it's not my clever arguments that are doing this. But I do think that this is always the way, if you look at the book of Acts, you will see that the form of evangelism taken by the disciples to convert the empire is a form of evangelism in which evidence is at the center. Now, I've got a good friend, right? I, I, can, I call him a friend, Ray Comfort, who I write a lot at his website on evangelism. But I will tell you that that form of evangelism, which I think is powerful, Show me my need first, show me who I really am, and then offer the solution. Pretty much a lot of you know 21st century, 20th century evangelism is based on that. Let me show you your need and then offer you the solution. But that is not what you're going to see in the book of Acts. You're going to see that Paul repeatedly, all these guys repeatedly, made a case for the Messiah based on the Old Testament and then said, and we saw all of it come to fruition in Jesus of Nazareth. Show that the Messiah must suffer, die, and rise again. 
in the Old Testament, and then claim as direct evidence that we saw it. We saw him do all those things, then die and rise again. That is consistently how the message of Christianity is, is given in the first century, and that's really the approach I took. But I don't think a lot of us are ready to do that. By the way, you'd have to know something about Christianity in order to take that approach. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's important for us to know what the evidence really is. Yeah, great point. Um, I guess two final questions, both yeah. I kind of have a personal vested interest in. One is for my brother. So I have, I have a brother who's very, very skeptical. Um, he's actually a religious pluralist. So, okay. I, so he, does, he doesn't buy into that Jesus was who he claimed to be, that he's kind of just more an important figure. And, you know, one thing he, because we don't have these conversations too often, because I don't want to seem like I'm forcing something. Sure. Like and, and family, it's harder, right? It's hard. Yeah. It's no prophets respected in his hometown. So I get it. So. Yeah. But, but so one of the things he kind of threw at me was because he knows how much time I've put into studying mm. this stuff. Yeah. And he, he was. But but have you done this? Have you read the entire Quran? Have you studied all the religions? You know, because maybe if you put all the same effort you've put into studying Christianity into all these other religions, it would be a different ball game. But. It, he seemed to think it was too yeah. much of an overwhelming bias because I've concluded that Christ is who he was. But and you stopped there. You, you didn't go on and, and do the Book of Mormon, Buddhism. You didn't. I mean, Hinduism, I, I, I do, I do Islam to a, a, an extent. You know, you have an hour video on YouTube about Mormonism, and I, you know, I've looked into that, and taken notes. Right. But but sir, you're right. So not to the degree that I spend in the New Testament, for example. Sure. So maybe you missed something. Maybe if you'd have done the same work you did in, in the... So here's how I always look at it. And I, I'm just, again, all my analogies go back to criminal work because it seems to me that we have this active um, laboratory for epistemology. You know, how do we know? How do we learn what we learn? How do we know what is true? How do we know what we know? Um, and we have a place we do that every day. We test these theories. We, we test arguments. We test evidential approaches. It's called criminal uh, courtrooms. We do it all the time. So I think a lot of times what we do in criminal courtrooms actually has application here. And I always say it this way. Look, so let's say, uh, how tall are you, Stelman? How tall are you? 5'8". Okay, so you're 5'8". So you're, so you're a white male, 5'8", with brown hair and a goatee. Okay, great. Or beard. Okay, great. So I take you to jail and I, I have evidence at the crime scene that it's your fingerprints, your DNA. I, I got people who saw you come and people who saw you leaving afterwards covered in blood. All the things I would typically use to make a case. And now I bring you into trial and I put you in front of a jury and I've got, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, I've got 35 pieces of evidence here that I am going to use that the only reasonable inference at the end of it, you will decide, is that this young man is guilty of this murder. Now, could you imagine at the end of that, the defense attorney standing up and saying, well, wait, wait, hey, hold on a minute. Okay, Stillman's a five foot eight white male with brown hair and a, and a beard. Has the, has the prosecutor shown you, did he work any other five foot eight white male with a beard? Do you know how many five foot eight white males with brown hair and beards there are in America? There's, you know, 1.7 million of these guys. Did he investigate all of those and make sure none of those fit this criteria? Now, how, how, how compelling would that be? Of course, that's ridiculous. If right. I've got good evidence that locks you in as the suspect, there's no need to go to suspect potential suspect number two, potential suspect number three. There's no re need for it. And I think that's what we do here. Now, you might have, if you, if you come, if you're going to, if you have a table full of religious worldviews, and you want to go through them. You just happen to pick them random. Who should I do first? Pick one. But if the evidence for that one confirms the validity of that one, you're done. There is no need. Because unless you think there's that God is so splintered and so schizophrenic that every single worldview, all of which contradict each other, they could all be wrong. But they mm -hmm. can't all be true because they make claims that are contradictory. So unless you think. Because, you know, we've got this problem with the law of non-contradiction, and you think that all of these could be equally true at the same time. Well, then go ahead and knock yourself out and look at all of them. But if you come to one, whatever, whatever one you pick first, if, you, if that one measures up and passes all the tests, you're done. And that's what happens here. Now, I, mm -hmm. I looked at Mormonism probably more deeply than I looked at Christianity because the only religious people I knew as a, an atheist was my, my stepmother and her seven, my seven, uh, my six half siblings, three, three boys and three girls. Mm 
So they were all Mormons. So I knew, so I looked at it seriously. So I can only say that about one other religious worldview, but it doesn't matter any more than it would make sense that if I brought you to trial because you, you fit the description, you were seen at the crime scene, your DNA is at the crime scene. I'd be silly for someone to say, well, yeah, but there's 1.7 million other white guys he didn't check out. Okay, that's, so I think that's a silly response. So the real question is, how strong is the case against Stellman? How strong is the case with Christianity? Knowing that, that he can't be, these two guys can't both be the killer. Only one is going to be. And so that they can't, there's a law of non-contradiction here. Same thing happens with these religious worldviews. They can't all be right because they don't make the same claim about God, the same claim about salvation, the same claim about the afterlife. These are very different claims. They could all be wrong. They can't all be right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great point. And I think it's an especially um, unusual case for Jesus because he made s such exclusive claims. Yeah. You know, he made he made the claim he's the only way to God. And so by definition, if that's true, there's no other way to God. The other religions don't check out. But also, right. if Jesus was wrong about what he claimed, well, then— Take him off the list. Exactly. There's, he, there's, there's no place for him in your framework because that's like right. Paul says it, the rest of it's irrelevant. If yeah, I mean, that. if you think he's some important teacher, well, important teachers don't make those kinds of false claims or those kinds of grandiose self-serving false claims. So so I think that, yeah, you have to kind of change your definition of who Jesus is then. And yeah. by the way, it, it may be that people do that then, that they say, okay, then fine, then Jesus is not even on my list. And that what I'm looking at really is, is what is it, those four things that would make these reliable accounts is simply, are they early enough to have been written by eyewitnesses? Is there any bit of touch point corroboration that can help us verify the accounts? Have they changed their story over time? And finally, do they possess the bias that we typically associate with liars? That's what we're looking for here. And this mm -hmm. is the same template that everyone thinks is good enough to apply to witnesses in the most important, highest level criminal trials in which someone has died and someone may die going forward if there's a death penalty in that state. These are the highest level trials that we offer. The highest stakes are offered at these trials, and they're over the most egregious crimes. I think if that, if 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 someone's temporal future, either in a, in a gas chamber or through lethal injection, or life in prison, is at stake, and this is the criteria we use. Why couldn't we use that criteria to look at someone's eternal destiny. I think it's, it, we can do that. We can, that's a decent, and by the way, there is no better, because the only standard above reasonable doubt as an SOP, the standard of proof, is beyond a possible doubt, and there's no way to get there. There's, there's no way you can, you, you don't have, you're not beyond a possible doubt on anything you believe. If you're watching this video, you might be dreaming that. You yeah. might come here tomorrow and search for this video. You can't find it. This whole thing's you might be in a in a matrix kind of universe. There are people who think the entire universe is nothing more than a computer simulation. All of this could be a lie. That always, as judges tell juries all the time, I can level a possible or imaginary doubt about anything. That's why the standard is not that high. It's reasonable doubt. That's as high as you can go. You can't get to possible. So yeah. that's why it's reasonable for us to apply that standard here. Yeah. Great, great answer. So last question. So this is something I, I hear all the time, but I'm the specific instance in my mind is Joe Rogan said it on his podcast. And I, I don't know why God puts certain people on your heart. I have this bit like a goal. I want to get on his podcast to really make this case to him. Because one and one of the claims he's made is how could we even trust the Bible or any of these documents? Because the council and Nicaea, they just threw them together willy-nilly. They had they had books, they they knew what they didn't want in their religion, and they just kind of constructed a religion based on what they want it to be in there. Cause you know, there's other gospels that we're not, we're not talking about here. Yeah. Well, okay. So, so that would be the case. If, if, he, if he's done his history on this, and this is why the chain of custody is so important, right? We want to know what version of the Jesus story is authentic, which one dates back, which version of the story, forget about the manuscripts for a minute. Because what we want to know, is Jesus the guy we think he is? Was he really, was that story about him being born of a virgin and working those miracles and dying on the cross and rising from the grave? These are the essential elements of the Jesus story. Is some of that just fiction added late? Is it, was there, Were there alter, alternatives to that story that were circulating early and had to be, okay, so we can do the history on that. And we know who the first hearers, the first students of the authors of the Gospels are in many cases. So with John, for example, we've got Ignatius and Polycarp and Papias. They sat at John's feet. 
And they wrote things about Jesus that we still have. So we can see what version of Jesus was John describing to them. We can use the first links in the chain of custody to, to uh, tell us what the, the link before was saying. And they passed that on to Irenaeus, one of their students. We can look at his. And by the way, Irenaeus made lists of it cut out from it. I don't know if you can hear Gospels, the Gospel of Peter, the Gospel of whatever. Those Gospels were not available. When Irenaeus made his list 150 years before any council, he made a list of what he thought were authoritative books. Hippolytus, his student, made a list of authoritative books. This idea that the Council of Nicaea, and by the way, the Council of Nicaea was focused on the deity of Christ. If he's looking for a council that's focused on the canon, that's the Council of Laodicea in 363, okay? Different council, all right? But if you're wondering, when did these books emerge? You can track it through the chain of custody. Uh, were there alternative stories about Jesus by the fourth century? Yes, just as you would expect if someone like Jesus arrived, sometimes skeptics will say, well, if someone like of that magnitude arrived, well, how come all we have is just this little pinpoint of information? Well, no, you have the same thing. You have, you have eyewitnesses, and then you have an explosion of legend over the years. The question is, do we still have the original eyewitness accounts? Don't, don't, don't be surprised if, if 300 years later someone's writing a lie. And by the way, the church fathers caught these lies as they were being written. I've got a whole section at Cold Case Christian, which is just on the non-canonical Gospels and why they are rejected. And you'll see that most of them are rejected because as they were being written, some church fathers said, hey, time out. <laughs> that group over there, that dude, those are a bunch of heretics over there, okay? In the end, I, I don't care what people say about Jesus. The theology we develop out of this, I, I don't have a preference in theology. I have a preference for eyewitness accounts. So if there are things that are written late in history, well, the eyewitnesses are already dead. Whatever that is, it cannot be an eyewitness account. That's why it was so important to me that I find out if the four Gospels were written early. It's not like I prefer the theology of the four Gospels over the theology of later non-canonicals. I prefer the eyewitness status of the four Gospels over late things that could not have been written by eyewitnesses. Now, whatever theology emerges from the eyewitness accounts, I got to live with that. But I'm not d dismissing these because they are theologically different. I'm dismissing these because they aren't eyewitness accounts. And as a matter of fact, there were some early documents used by the early church. Um, the letter of uh, the Epistle of Barnabas was used by the early church. Um, the Shepherd of Hermas was used by the early church. A, a letter by Clement, who's a student of Paul, who became a, a bishop in Rome, First Clement, was used by the early church. But these were not accounts that people believe were written by eyewitnesses. They don't get into your canon. Isn't that comforting to know that one of the first criteria for uh, the canon was that the thing had to be written by an eyewitness? Well, okay, yeah. that, that helps me because that, that's what I would want. I don't care what, it, what, I'm not like this person who imagines what kind of theology I prefer. I'm just stuck with the theology that emerges from the eyewitness accounts. And I count Paul as an eyewitness because he says he saw Jesus on the road to Damascus. And he often that would say, hey, you should listen to me too. Why do I count? Because I'm also an eyewitness. Didn't I also see? 1 Corinthians 15, an amazing early creed. You can date that creed to within three years of the resurrection. And Gary Habermas, the, 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 uh, the scholar, has done that. Let me tell you what that creed says. Are you ready? He mm -hmm. says, it says, uh, he says, for I, um, um, he talks about, he's talking to the church in Corinth, okay? He says, I passed on to you what I also received, that, that Christ died on the cross, according to the scripture, for our sins, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the 12. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brethren at one time, most of whom remain until now, although some have fallen asleep, some were dead, but a lot of those 500 were still alive. Then he appeared to James, he says in the same verse, this is three to eight in first Corinthians 15. And then he appeared to all the apostles, and then get this, it says, and last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared to me also. Well, why is that important? Because this is what qualifies Paul as a scripture writer. Scripture writers had to be eyewitnesses. Look at the scriptures. Look at the New Testament. Those guys are all eyewitnesses. Those guys are all guys who knew the living Jesus.
They all had a touch of the living Jesus. That's why their books are, and that's why first Clement, just the very next generation, he, Clement didn't know Jesus, but he sure knew Paul, and he wrote a very orthodox, beautiful book called First Clement, but it's not in your scripture. Why? Because Clement didn't know Jesus. That doesn't get in. That comforts me, and that's why I'm not interested in, I don't reject these things because I don't like them. I don't like what they say about Jesus, or I don't like the theology that emerges from the non-canonical gospels. I reject them because they came in hundreds of years too late to be eyewitness accounts. They're too late in history. Oh, they're so good, Jim. They're like in the early second century. Well, that's too late to have been an eyewitness. I don't care if you can put them in 120, 125, 130 AD. It's too late. I'm looking for the people who knew Jesus personally. And remember, he was died on the cross in the 30s. So 130 is too late. Yeah. But okay, that, that is a great point. Um, we are unfortunately out of time. The books are Cold Case Christianity, God's Crime Scene, and Forensic Faith. The website is coldcasechristianity.com. You can follow them on Twitter at Jay Warner Wallace. Is there any other places people should be on the lookout for you? Well, we, we, we really want to help young people. And you know that the skepticism starts a lot earlier than you used to, used to be, you know, a generation ago. A generation ago, if you weren't a Christian by the age of 18, most Christians became Christians by the age of 18. Eighty five percent at 18 was the old number. Well, now it's like 85 percent at 13, 85 percent at 12. Why is that number dropping? Because we have access to the Internet and skepticism starts much earlier. So we want to start with young people much earlier to teach them the tools of the trade, to teach them how to be good detectives when it comes to the scripture. So we have a, another website called casemakersacademy.com, which is just for eight to 12 year olds. It's really focused, same books. They're just written for eight to 12 year olds. So they're all kids versions. And the idea there is that we need to start with our kids a lot earlier because let's face it, by the time you're in high school, you probably made a decision about this already. And I think that's too late. We need to do it a lot earlier, so that's why we're starting that early. Yeah, that, that reminds me. I should mention, um, for Cold Case Christianity and God's Crime Scene, there are, there are kids' versions. Well, Actually, and for I, Forensic Faith now, too. we got kids' oh, versions okay. for all I, three. I see that yeah. one. Great. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah I, I bought uh, Cold Case Christianity for kids for a friend of mine who has kids for her daughter, and uh, I, I, I hope, hope it turns out good. Um, well, you're, you're the best to, to do that. The, 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 I can tell you that the, the most satisfying aspect of the work we're doing, right, is is when um, a young person says, wow, this really helped me to think about not just Christianity, but about all kinds of claims about his, history, claims about reality, because we're trying to teach those detective skills that are really kind of just good critical thinking skills. And that's what we're trying to do there. So there's nothing more satisfying than having someone come up to you who's 10 years old and go, wow, I've read, the, I've read all your books. Really? Well, I mean, wow. my mom hasn't read all my books, okay? <laughs> so thank you for reading the books. I felt pretty impressed. Yeah, awesome. Well, um, unfortunately, we got to go. Jay Warner Wallace, thank you so much for being here, brother, and I hope to have you back soon. Oh, well, let's do it again for sure.